the top story was, of course, Red Bull Lawrence. They looked insanely confident, fast. The entire team, both drivers and Christian Horner, seemed very, very pleased with their testing. Is that what you saw as well? It went incredibly smoothly. And I think the big thing was that they put the car on the ground and within the first day, they were able to extract performance from it. We saw some of the other teams work through a lot of different setup variables, variables, which Red Bull, of course, did. But no matter where they put that car, it seemed to be relatively quick. And so over short performance runs where they take a bit of fuel out, they still have a fair bit in there, uh, which, of course, slows the lap time slightly. But from those runs, they were the fastest uh, by the end mm -hmm. of testing. Sergio Perez set the fastest time on the final evening. And then on the long runs as well, where they tried to simulate a little bit how the car will um, go in the race and how it will treat its tyres, all these incredibly important things for winning Grand Prix. Well, they were pretty quick with that as well. So it's that level of confidence. Also, the, the car, um, it was... It is an evolution of last year's car, but a lot of the concepts are the same, which kind of tells you that they got it right the first time round. And of course, when you're building a Formula One car, that's the best approach to have, because then you just keep adding performance more and more and more each year, each upgrade package. And so they almost certainly haven't got lost over the winter and they do go into the first race in Bahrain absolutely as a team to beat. It felt a bit like some of the Mercedes years, didn't it, in terms of preseason testing when, you know, there were a lot of interesting stories and it was just clear, like, you know, mm -hmm. everything that was out in front, you know, Ferrari was saying it, Mercedes was saying it from the very first minute we started testing. It was like, that's the car to beat this year. So we'll see. I mean, obviously it's a long season to develop, but going into the year, I don't think this is how we used to feel about kind of some of Lewis Hamilton's seasons going into those when he was dominating. It was like clearly there in front, you know, can they, can they, can and can anyone else pull that back? And if you compare 12 months ago, Ferrari just came out of testing in a much better place. Uh, I don't think they had a bad testing, but I mean, relative to Red Bull, you know, they, it felt sure. like they were really, really close to them. Whereas this time, maybe, I don't think they've maybe fallen off, but I think Red Bull have just maintained that advantage out in front. So to that point then, how far is the gap? How much further ahead is Red Bull compared to everybody else right now? That's the really big question. And we won't know for certain until we get to qualifying. That's the boring mm -hmm. answer. But um, doing a bit of speculation and kind of looking into the times and trying try, try to understand who's quick and, and, and not on different tyres at different times of the day. And it looks like about 0.3 seconds that Red Bull has over Ferrari, um, possibly more over Mercedes. And then Aston Martin also seems to be very close to Mercedes, perhaps, according to some people, even ahead. So um, that's a pretty big gap. You know, 0.3 of a second is, is a lot. And the other thing that we noticed in the race, again, to go back to how they look after the tyres, which is so important for getting the strategy right. Well, the Red Bull seems to be able to just look after its tyres, hit consistent times mm -hmm. throughout a long run with heavy fuel. The Ferrari tended to lose performance throughout the run, which was a suggestion that the tyres were uh, starting to degrade and have problems. It may be that Ferrari were just experimented with some kind of slightly extreme setups which hurt the tires in ways but i don't know i i feel like everything that red bull did it just seemed to work and everything that maybe ferrari and mercedes did to try and catch up and make the difference had some kind of negative side effects so uh i think that's what we're looking at but yeah um mm -hmm. we we never quite know until we get into qualifying and the other thing we should say is that we've only had testing at one circuit um sure. of course it is the circuit that has the first race but then if you go to saudi arabia which is the second race australia again very very different circuit again uh you could get different results so we're not saying the championship is over before it's even begun but we mm -hmm. are saying the rebel are going in uh with a big target on them but probably a target that's going to get smaller and smaller and smaller throughout the race for the other teams Really quickly before we move on to the other teams testing, Lawrence, are they riding the rear end of the car lower than we've seen? Yeah, I, I saw a story around that um, from Auto Motor and Sport. Uh, they got a kind of source from Mercedes suggesting that Red Bull are doing that. Um, it's impossible to tell from trackside. We're talking mm -hmm. millimeters, and uh, I wasn't able to get close enough to go and measure it. Get your um, measuring stick out. Absolutely. So, uh, yeah, potentially. And it could just be that, uh, you know, again, the teams run through different ride height settings. That's part of what testing is, ride height settings, wing mm -hmm. levels, all sorts of stuff, just trying to find um, the place where the car is offering the most performance, trying to find the point at which you start to induce the bouncing and porpoising that we were talking about yeah. so much last year. Um, so it may just be the case the Red Bull are able to kind of get a little bit closer. But the one thing I will say is that if you can run the car lower, you are going to extract more downforce and 
ultimately performance uh, from the underfloor of the car. And so if they are able to do that, if that story is correct, uh, then that's probably quite worrying for everyone else. I would think so. Nate, you had mentioned Ferrari a little bit ago. Overall testing seemed to go well for the team. Uh, their team principal, new team principal, Fred Visser, uh, had some interesting comments that they're not going to pick a number one driver at the start. Now, later on in the season, if somebody is significantly higher in the standings and they'll act accordingly, what do you make of that between Charles Leclerc and Carlos Sainz? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I think, to be honest with you, I think from his position coming in when he has and, and you know, trying to rebuild that team, I think he has to kind of, he has to be on the fence about that question. So. And if you look at Ferrari, yeah, if you look at Ferrari over the past couple of seasons, Charles has been the better performer in terms of the wins he's had. But I think Carlos has been good enough that you could imagine at this point in the season that he could go in and he could, you know, maybe be the better of the two early on. He could, you know, if, if there's a championship chance, maybe he can get in there. I would always back Charles Leclerc just on a on a personal level in terms of who's gonna who's gonna be the better Ferrari driver over the season. Um but I think it's really presumptive of Ferrari. If he I think if he'd come out and said, yeah, we're backing one driver over the other, you know, it's a massive it, it, you know be even bigger story, right? Yeah, and so I think a lot of fans were like, "How can they not back one over the other?" But I don't see how he could have ever come out and said said either of those things. And I think that the smart thing to do um, is to, you know, is to probably back the lead car. You know, one of the things that Mercedes that Ferrari did so badly last year at a few races was they didn't seem to back the car that was in the best position, and that seems to be the best way to to run strategy. Now, whether that is always Charles Leclerc, that's a different matter. Um, but yeah, I think Ferrari, I, and I think. Ferrari bosses always seem to get that question a bit more than anyone else because Ferrari are kind of so synonymous with team orders just over the years. So I think that the Italian press especially love to throw that at, at whoever is kind of the Ferrari boss. Um, and I'm always just kind of like, well, what's he going to say? He's not going to say, yeah, we only, we, you know, we only think Charles can win the title this year because you know you basically got civil war from the very beginning of the of his season there. But I think what will happen is is if let's say Ferrari can have a title challenge this year or next, mm -hmm. naturally the team will just focus towards the other driver i think that's the best way to run a team and if you're the second driver there you understand it because you think well if i'd wanted to you know this favoritism from second half of the season onwards i should have been in the title fight so that's the best way to do it and i think fred Vasseur, he seems like quite a, a straight up guy as well you know he says it how it is so you know if they had been backing someone secretly i think he probably would have just said it normally speaking on this podcast we hit red bull ferrari and then we discuss Mercedes. But I'm not going to do that on today's show because Aston Martin has all kinds of hype after testing. Lawrence, is it warranted or not? Um, it's Yeah, it is kind of warranted. I mean, it, it isn't so far that we're talking about a team that was at the back of the midfield, certainly at the start of last year, really towards mm -hmm. the back of the grid. They made good progress last year, and then they made another significant step this year. So in my ranking, I had them fourth behind the big three, but I also had them close to them, uh, which is not something that I expected going in, in, into this season. So um, it looks good. And a lot of the hype is based around a race simulation towards the end of the final day of testing. Uh, for people that aren't used to following testing, a race simulation kind of is what it says on the tin that teams will put a race amount of fuel in the car and they'll go through exactly the process of what they would do in a race to the point that they even do a kind of warm-up lap they go out uh, do some burnouts on the way to the end of the pit lane and then they do their race start from there and then they do the 57 laps of the Bahrain Grand Prix with full race pit stops mm -hmm. in between to change tires uh, to simulate exactly what it's like being in a race now Alonso did that Fernando Alonso did that on the final day in the evening and his times were very impressive they were quicker than pretty much anybody else who had attempted a race simulation throughout the whole week so you think wow you know if you were to put them all against each other aston martin could go and win however he also had the very best of the track conditions and no one else really went out and attempted the same thing at the same time of day that fernando did so if you also look at some of the other teams and how much performance they gained on that final evening uh partly because um in bahrain they test after the sunset so the sun goes down the track cools the floodlights come on so they can still yeah. see where they're going and um when they're out there in, in those temperatures, it's a lot easier on the tires. So they can push harder on the tires, extract more performance from them. Uh, there's By that stage of testing the final evening, there's a lot more rubber that's been left on the track from all the other drivers going around. And at that particular time, there were lots of drivers going around doing uh, performance style runs. So on very soft tires, which leave even more rubber on the track. So the conditions were absolutely perfect. Uh, Fernando Alonso's times were very good, but we expect that of Fernando Alonso. He's a two-time world champion. He's arguably one of the top drivers on the grid. So uh, 
when you put it all together and you try and understand exactly what it all meant, yes, it was quick. Yes, it was probably quicker than anyone expected from Aston Martin going into testing. But is it enough to challenge the top three? Like when I was See. weighing it up, I felt maybe not. It's. I mean, I'm fully on board with uh, the Fernando Alonso hype train at this point. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 um, I'm not gonna. I think some people are sort of saying, you know, that they could challenge third or season, maybe second or season. We don't know yet, you know. And I think Lawrence is right to caveat a lot of that. But I think this is such a great situation for Formula One because for years and years and years we've wanted Fernando Alonso to be in a car where he can kind of at least compete. Again. I think at Alpine he occasionally had that, but it was more of a midfield car, you know, it kind of sat there as best of the rest. And if this car is up there, you know, we have all of these different things. I mean, you'll, you'll have him and Lewis going wheel to wheel, you know, I think the Verstappen will probably be up the road, but maybe he can go and, you know, have a, have kind of a bite at the Ferrari drivers every so often. And I think it's really going to show people how good he is. And I think if Max is dominating early in the season, it could actually turn out to be a really great storyline. You know, Fernando's up there, you know, challenging for some podiums and stuff like that. One thing that was pretty interesting, actually, that Fernando did say was that um, obviously we haven't seen Lance Stroll uh, in that car. He's he's missed mm -hmm. preseason testing because what we believe is a fractured wrist from a from a bicycle accident, but it's not been confirmed exactly what it is. But he said the one thing the team lacked from their preseason was the ability to compare the car to last year. Obviously, Lance has that reference point. He didn't have that. He just tested the car in Abu Dhabi at the end of the season. So he said that was one thing that he felt the team was lacking coming out of the season. And he suggested that actually it means Aston Martin does have quite a lot of progress it can make, you know, in the coming weeks. So I think that everything he said was pretty positive. And I think, you know, when, when rival teams are kind of saying, yeah, this car here looks really quick, you kind of sit up and listen and that's what was happening. Um, so, yeah, you know, I don't think we're going to have a situation where Alonso's a dark horse for the championship, but what it does mean, you know, if this car is where it is, Alonso signed a three year deal to come back and win a championship. If yeah. they've jumped from, from what was it seventh that they finished last year all the way up to kind of that top three if they've turned that top three into a top four even if they've turned it into a top 3.5 and they're there at some circuits there are others suddenly you're like well that's the baseline for the next two years of development for this car so it'd be a super super awesome storyline for formula one and anybody even if you you know like or like or loathe fernando yeah. alonso on track, he's one of the. I think he's. I put him up there with Lewis and Max. I think it's Lewis, Max, Fernando, and then maybe Charles is just kind of Charles and George are just kind of creeping up into that top tier. But they need to show a bit more to be up there. Fernando's mega. So if if this is what we think it might be, then it's a great story for Formula One. And um, yeah, I'm I'm excited. I mean, that to be honest with you, coming out of testing was the thing I was most excited about. I thought if if we really do have him up there, then you know maybe there is life in this championship yet. Maybe there is a lot to be excited about. Nate's on the train, Alonzo Mania. He's all for 100%. it. 100%. I, I bought all my tickets. I've bought 23 <laughs> tickets for the year. <laughs> no refunds. Uh, I love it. I love it. Yes, massive gains for Aston Martin. Thanks so much for watching ESPN on YouTube. And for more sports highlights and analysis, be sure to download the ESPN app. And for premium content and live streaming, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.